Chapter 14. The new president committed the managing of all things abroad to Captain Smith, who, by his own example, good words and fair promises, set some to mow, others to buy and thatch, some to build houses, other to thatch them, himself always bearing the greatest task for his own share. William Simons, The Proceedings. Captain Newport does not return in October with new supplies, but instead of being hungrier, we have finally gotten through the sickness and we are healthy again. The tribes who are our friends must have convinced our enemies to stop attacking us, and it is no longer dangerous to leave the fort to hunt or fish. We have a pitiful harvest of wheat and vegetables from our gardens, but the Indians often bring us food from their own harvests to trade. The air is filled with birds flying south for the winter, and it is easy to shoot enough for a meal. We have more rain, and the river water is good to drink. Captain Smith has been put in charge of trading with the Indians. If we ever run short of corn or meat, he takes a few men and some of the beads and copper for trading, and sails off in the shallop for a few days to visit some of the Indian villages. They always come back with the shallop full of supplies. Captain Smith is also in charge of getting houses built for all of us. With the weather turning colder, we can't keep sleeping in our rotting tents. He sets for us the goal of houses for everyone and cheers us on, exhorting us to push ahead. We work hard together. Captain Smith always working the hardest, with some felling trees, some splitting wood for clapboard, some cutting reeds for thatch. We use shaped timbers to frame the houses, and the carpenters teach us how to weave sticks together to make a mesh, then coat the mesh with a mixture of river clay and straw to make the wattle and daub walls. We bundle the reeds to make the thatched roofs. I have never helped to build a house before, and it makes me proud to see my work. I see what Captain Smith meant about us needing to stand on many legs to survive. We have to work together. I would never be able to build a house all by myself. Some of the gentlemen work hard with us too, until their hands are rough as commoners' hands. By the time the weather turns cold, we have put up warm, dry houses for everyone, even the servants. In early December, Captain Smith chooses nine men to sail with him in the shallop up the Chickahominy River, they are hoping to find the passage to the Pacific Ocean and the Orient, and they think that Chickahominy might lead to it. When I ask Captain Smith why this passage to the Pacific is so important, he explains it to me. The nobles in England want spices and silks and ivory. The best place to get them is the Orient, China, and India. Between England and the Orient goes going east over land, are the Ottoman Turks. The Turks gladly sell us all the Chinese silks and Indian spices we want. They buy it for a tuppence and then sell it to England for bags of gold. We can find a way to the Orient over the ocean going west. We can skip the Turks altogether and that would make the Virginia Company investors very happy and very rich. Captain Smith and his men leave on a frosty morning, and we all wish them well. Once Captain Smith is gone, though, the gentlemen stop working, and even the common men shirk their chores. If it wasn't for us servants, the food wouldn't get cooked, the water wouldn't get toted, and the wood wouldn't get chopped for the fires. One cold morning in mid-December, Rich and I are working with the embers that are all that is left of our cabin's fire, trying to bring them to flame. Richard sprinkles dry moss on the embers and I blow on them softly. And for and the at the first hint of flame, we had twigs. It feels good to be cooperating with Richard, to be his friend. Come on, fire, Richard coaxes. I rub my hands together to warm them. It was Abram and Henry's turn to feed the fire during the night, but they, just like everyone else, don't think much of chores these days. The twig catches, 
We had some bigger chips of wood. Keep blowing, and soon we have a good fire going. <coughs> I cough on the smoke. We don't have a proper hearth with a chimney like Mum and I used to have in our cottage. This is just a circle of stones on our dirt floor. And to let the smoke out, there's a hole at the top of the eaves. Our cabin is always smoky. It doesn't even have any windows, and it has begun to leak in heavy rains but it is still a lot better than a rotting tent. Within minutes, there's a voice at the door. We need an ember, comes a demand. Richard and I look at each other. Every morning, it is the same. As soon as everyone sees smoke coming from our cabin, they come for embers because they all let their fires go completely out during the night. I open the door and find Master Crofts dressed in his thick wool cossack and look rather blue-lipped from the cold. I take his spoon, fish out an ember from our fire, and send him on his way. He doesn't even thank me. I think they'd freeze if they didn't have us around, I say. And starve, says Richard. Next comes Master Halgrave, then Master Frith, then Nathaniel, who has become a soldier, asking for an ember for the soldier's cabin. Look how disciplined our soldiers are, Richard says after Nathaniel leaves. Richard puts an ember into a pan to take to Reverend Hunt in case his fire too has gone out. I go to see if anyone has bothered to start the hominy in the big communal pot, cook pot. I hear one of the guards call out, It is the shallop! Oh, it is the shallop return! Hello, explorers! Have you found the passage to India? Captain Smith must be back. I rush to the fort gates. Six men come trailing in. They are tired, dragging their muskets as they walk. There's not a smile among them, and Captain Smith is not with them. They have come to the communal cook fire to warm themselves. There, Abram is stirring the big pot of hominy, a porridge we make from coarse ground corn. The rest of us gather around. We listen as they give their report. The river became too shallow to explore with a shallop. Captain Smith went off with the two with two men, Jehu Robinson and Thomas Emery, to find an Indian guide and a canoe. He did not return. Indians captured one of their men, George Casson. The last they saw of him, he was tied to a stake with a fire being built around him. They were glad to escape with their lives. I listened, my heart sinking lower and lower. Has Captain Smith been captured by the Indians as well? Has he too been killed? Abram scoops the hominy into the mess pots, but I don't want to eat. I leave the fort and go down to the riverbank. There was horror fra frost last night, and all of the bare branches are coated white and sparkling. I walk along the river a little way, then sit down on jumble of tree roots and look out across the dark river, dark water. What will happen to me now? I have seen how Henry and Abram have been treated since Master Wingfield was put under arrest. It is as if, as if, it is if they were suddenly declared every gentleman's servant, always washing this one's stockings, fetching that one's firewood. President Radcliffe sometimes puts them on double watch shifts so, they, so that they get no rest and they go around red-eyed, and bad-tempered. But being overworked would not be the worst of it. No, the worst would be losing someone I have grown to trust and care about. I pick up a small stone and throw it sidearm, making it skip across the water. Five skips. Richard and I should have a contest. I'm suddenly very grateful that Richard is now my ally and not my enemy. Reverend Hunt, too. I am thankful that he is still with us. Without the two of them, I would have no one to care whether I live or die. In London, it was easy to survive on my own, rummaging in garbage for my meals. Here, it is better to have a few people to stick up for you and make sure you get your food rations. More legs to stand on, Captain Smith would say. I hear crunching, footsteps in the frozen dead leaves covering the ground. It is Richard. He is carrying my bowl and spoon. He hands me the steaming bowl of hominy and sits next to me. Thank you, I say. 
I am very hungry now. It would have been miserable to go all day without breakfast. He nods, wraps his arms around his knees, and rests his chin on them. Maybe he will still come back, he says. Maybe. When my bowl is empty, I pick up a flat stone. How many skips can you do, I ask? Richard grins. More than you, that's for sure. The we gather stones and the contest is on. The letter comes just before Christmas. The three Indian messengers bring it to the fort gates, and I rejoice to see Captain Smith's handwriting. I am well, the letter says. Fire the cannons and a few rounds from your muskets to scare these fellows, and give them a handful of beads, a pound of copper, and five hatchets, which I have promised to give to the Pamunkis. I run to tell Wicker Robin Hunt and Richard. He is with the Pamunkis, I explain. They are one of the friendly tribes. I see he, is, he still has his paper and quill. Oh, I see he still has his paper and quill with them, says Reverend Hunt. He must still be writing our story, I say beaming. Just after New Year, 1608, Richard goes out before me to start the cook pot of hominy for our communal breakfast. He comes back not five minutes later, his face white as linen. It's gone, he whispers. The corn, all of it. What do you mean it's gone, I ask. Yesterday there was plenty, enough for two weeks at least. Richard shakes his head. I look for the barrel of smoked meat too and baskets of dried oysters, gone. I feel the blood drain from my face. Are natives now stealing our food instead of bringing it to us? Or have raccoons and foxes gotten into our stores? But we had men on guard all night. I run out to the cabin to see for myself. Richard is right. Our food is gone. Then I notice something else. The fort is eerily quiet. There is hardly anyone around. The only activity is two laborers chopping firewood. And a soldier sitting outside his cabin, cleaning his musket. The sun is already up, and the gentlemen should have been grumbling for their breakfast. The day is quite cold, with a pale winter sun, and yet not a single gentleman has come to our cabin for an ember. Where are they, I demand, growing fear growing in the pit of my stomach. Who, Richard asked. The gentlemen.